Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. 2024 is an election year for the UK, which means the pre-election bribes have already started to heat up. The most dynamic economies tend to be places with lower taxes. So my priority in the budget will be growth. But tax cuts probably won't be enough to win over young voters. Only 10% of under 50s are planning to vote Tory at the next election. Wow. So they need to do something about the housing crisis. And the geniuses at number 10 have decided on a plan to have 1% deposit mortgages for first time buyers. There have also been some shocking stats released on the state of the housing crisis, which I want to go through with you guys today as well. The most common living arrangement for people 18 to 34 years old was living with parents and that shot up over time. In addition to that, the price of houses relative to wages is the highest it's been in 150 years. The number of young adults living with their parents, in my opinion, is a national crisis. Older generations might not understand the kind of impact that this delayed start to adulthood really has, but we can see it here in the fertility rate alone. It doesn't take a scientist to realize that people aren't gonna start family when they're living with their parents. I just feel really close to you. So where do you see us going? Trip, as long as you're up, son. Oh, oh come on, pop but why are they living with parents? Well, to put it bluntly, it's the only way they can save enough money to afford a house. Between 1910 and 1990, there were 80 years where the average price of a house was only around four times average earnings. That meant that the British middle classes flourished and expanded as people were able to start their own families and buy their own houses. But since then, the ratio of price to earnings is now 10 times the average wages. According to the FT's calculations, it used to take only around four to five years to afford a deposit for a house, whether you're in London or otherwise. But now that number has increased massively to nearly 30 years for London and 12 years for the rest of the UK. Pretty much nobody is going to be able to afford to buy in London without parental help. And that's really shocking when you consider that London is the most economically productive part of the UK. The more people that live there, the more productive the UK is as a whole. But that's not possible anymore. So the scale of the crisis is pretty bad, right? Why haven't politicians or the government done anything about it? After all, for the last two years, the government has been battling the cost of living or inflation crisis. And much of that was offset by the fact that wages rose by a similar amount to inflation. And yet they've pretty much done nothing about the housing crisis, which makes it all the more interesting that now in an election year, they've finally come up with a plan to address it. There's only two ways to make houses more affordable, give people money to buy them or subsidize it or build more houses. And obviously one is a lot harder to achieve than the other. The proposal that the government is going to go with is give people money to buy houses or it's doing it in the form of guaranteeing mortgages to banks if people fail to pay them so that they can offer 1% deposit mortgages. Banks don't typically offer 1% mortgages because they're highly risky to them. If somebody defaults on their debt when they only have 1% equity in their house, that means that if the price of the house has dropped by 5%, let's say, then the bank, even if they repossess your home, end up making a 4% loss. Whereas if you had a 10% stake in the house, the price of the house drops by 5% and you default on your debt, if the bank repossesses your house, they still make all of their money back and you get 5% as well. Under the government proposal, the government would step in and guarantee or refund any losses that a bank makes on defaults by a 1% mortgage buyer. But what kind of impact would this actually have on young first time buyers? Well, currently, if there's a £300,000 house and someone has to save up a 10% deposit on it, they would have to save up £30,000, which is pretty hard to achieve. Whereas under this proposal, they would only have to save up 1% or £3,000, which is far more achievable. That seems like a great idea, right? Well, what's the catch? there is a huge catch and that comes in the form of housing affordability tests. After the 2008 recession, rules were brought in to prevent homeowners from borrowing more than 4.5 times their annual salary in mortgage amount. 
And if you were to buy a £300,000 house, it would mean that you would have to earn £66,500 per year to pass the housing affordability test and borrow £299,000. And that's a really difficult wage to achieve in most of the country. In London, where you possibly could achieve that kind of a wage, the house prices would be double £300,000 at least. So you would have to earn over £100,000. The number of people actually benefited by this proposal will be exceedingly small. But what's the true intention of the government in proposing this? Well, even if a minority of people are benefited by this, a spike in demand for houses will cause house prices to increase. And if you hadn't noticed, they haven't been doing so well for the last two years because of interest rates. If house prices spike somewhat, the government will gain support, the Conservative government will gain more votes, and they'll be more likely to win the next election. So I think this is a very cynical attempt to win votes rather than an attempt to solve the housing crisis. Labour has called out this policy, saying that only supply side fixes can actually solve the housing crisis in the long term. And in my opinion, they're 100% correct. If you look at the total number of houses being built in the current year, it is far below numbers seen in previous decades. A lot of this is due to local authorities no longer building council housing, and that was actually caused by the right to buy scheme that the Conservatives introduced in 1980. In order to increase the number of middle class homeowners that are more likely to vote Tory, the Conservative government in 1980 released a scheme called the right to buy scheme. That allowed social housing tenants to purchase the properties that they lived in for an extremely discount price relative to the market rate. This has cost the government around £75 billion since 1980. But in addition to that, it's meant that councils have run out of housing stock and the central government has instead had to massively increase the amount of housing benefit that it provides to people in need of it. If you thought it couldn't get any worse, it can. Around 40% of the houses that were sold under the right to buy scheme are now being privately let out. And many of the people who are renting these houses are people who are on housing benefit. That means the government is effectively subsidizing the people who were originally bought the houses for a discount to house people that need it. When if they had just kept the houses, they could have given those houses to these social housing tenants for free. This is obviously a terrible deal for councils and it's no wonder that the amount of social house building by them has gone down so much since 1980. Labour has promised to actually take a look at this practice and potentially stop it, but they haven't really committed that firmly on it and I don't think anything will be done about it despite the obvious downsides. The lack of council houses isn't the only thing affecting the housing market or lack of building new houses in the UK. The other major factor is planning permission. It's really difficult to obtain planning permission in the UK, especially for greenfield sites. After the war in the post-war period, a large number of houses had been destroyed during the war, so they tried to build back a lot in a very quick period. But this angered many who saw the rise of sprawling suburbia as a very negative thing. And so much stricter planning laws were brought into place to prevent green space from being affected by suburbia. The decision of whether to grant permission to house builders to build new houses in an area is usually left up to local authorities. And those local authorities are usually picked by the homeowners of that area. Studies have shown that areas with more expensive housing are a lot less likely to grant permission to house builders to build new houses. That's effectively nimbyism. The problem with all of this has meant that in the rich and wealthy southeast of the country and London, it's left little room for house builders to build new houses, even though these areas are the most productive parts of the UK and house building there has slowed to a crawl. Meanwhile, in the rest of the country where nobody really wants to live and the productivity is low, houses are being built just fine. The problem with NIMBYs in the UK is a real one, and I thought this tweet by Sarah Olney, a Lib Dem MP, was very telling. It basically called for nighttime flights to be banned as her constituents were complaining about the noise. But when you actually think about it, the economic good done by having nighttime flights far outweighs the cost to 
her local constituents and she should be ignored. She was made fun of rightly on the internet for a long time. Maybe the solution to NIMBYs is to hand them ASBOs. I've seen this recent other tweet which was also very funny. But anyway, let me know what you guys think about the Tory plans for dealing with the housing crisis, what you think about the housing crisis stats in general, and if you enjoyed the video, please leave me a like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time.